Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. In the energy space right now, we have a lot of M&A activity. We have the energy transition. And I always look for experts because I went to Oklahoma State University. I need a little help sometime. And I've got JT Tung today, and he is with Tung Associates. And we're here on the first part of a series getting ready to rumble out and talk about some big things. How are you today? Great, Stu. Thanks for having me on. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, I went from high energy to thanks, Stu. <laughs> 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 well, you and I met and had a, a talk a little while ago. Tell us a little bit about you, uh, JT, and what are you working on at uh, Tongue and Associates? Yeah, absolutely. My background's uh, predominantly in natural gas. I've been in oil and gas for the last 15 years uh, after my time in the military. Um, went to West Point, did six years in the Army, and then jumped right into oil and gas, which was a good transition because it's a very uh, similar community and culture, which was yep. great, but found my way predominantly into uh, natural gas and um, predominantly in the Northeast. So I'm from Maine and uh, have been able to maintain a career up here in New England, working with utilities, uh, pipelines, LNG operators, that kind of thing. So uh, I've been doing a lot on the development side, building LNG infrastructure, uh, building pipeline infrastructure, CNG, LNG. But about four years ago, I transitioned to mergers and acquisitions. Yep. And uh, I'm trying to uh, continue in the natural gas space, oil and gas space, but also on the M&A side. So helping lower middle market, family owned businesses, small operators that are looking to exit for various reasons. And we can kind of talk about some of those reasons, what, what the pressure is oh. on the uh, small operator these days. Yep. And so I'm using my oil and gas background uh, with a focus on mergers and acquisitions. So helping business owners sell their companies. And and when you you uh, sit back and take a look at um, you're a are you a junior? Is your dad also? I a junior? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, Jeff Towns the second, so I go by JT. Uh, my dad is Jeff Towns Senior, and he actually uh, started the M and A practice 35 years ago. Wow! And I partnered with him uh, recently, joined as a partner to kind of grow and expand the uh, family practice. You know, I love uh, Maine uh, up in that area. Uh, I was there years and years ago when I was a, a lad and uh, I love the offshore fishing and all of that area. Yokin's restaurant was one of my favorite restaurants, had all of the whaling and everything up in that area. And uh, I remember sitting there on the old bar stool with my dad, who was coming in from um, uh, the, the military base, and he would come in from TDY or delivering airplanes around the world, B-47s, yep. and he would come in and I'd sit there just to have... I can smell the eggs and the bacon out nice. of that. So I've got some great memories of Maine up there. Yeah, so. it's a beautiful state. Nice place to raise a family. You know, you can be in the mountains, you can be on the ocean. Um, but if you want to be in the oil and gas industry, you got to make your way through Houston every once in a while. So <laughs> I do a lot of traveling. Hey, thank you for your service, by the way, too, because yeah. I've uh, I got such fond memories. Tell us what you're seeing in the industry, because your help with the M&A space is just we've seen it from the big boys. I'm seeing it from the little guys and I'm seeing it midstream. I'm it, it's just unbelievable on the consolidation and and really jockeying for position. But what are you seeing? Yeah, yeah, very much the same. Um, a lot of consolidation going on. Um, there's still a lot of fragmentation within the oil and gas and energy services space. So small mom and pop operators. Um, equipment manufacturers, service providers that are pretty fact fragmented by basin or by region, and right. they're 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 having a hard time competing. So first thing is they're they're aging out, so they're at retirement age. They built the business for thirty years. Um, yeah. They they don't always have somebody to hand it over to in the family. Yeah. Um, I think the transition from first to second generation is only like thirty percent of companies, and then it just drops wow. off going from second to third generation. So yeah. that that generational transition is very difficult. Um, and then just competing, right? So operating as a small, uh, lower middle market operator, which I'd say is in the five to 20 million revenue space, um, hard to find labor, uh, service technicians, uh, qualified help, right? You're competing with large operators that are willing to 
do sign on bonuses and, and pay more. So labor's a, a, a major issue. Um, the younger generation's not getting into oil and gas, right? They're going tech, financial services, um, right. marketing. So there's a constrained labor pool. Um, it's hard to compete against the the large guys. So there's just a lot of consolidation. And, um, you know, my dad always says, uh, you know, he, he lived through the 2008 crash. Right. And folks that had built their business up and saw the market crash, they had to wait another five to 10 years before they could exit, before the business was worth what they needed right. to retire. So I think 2020, 2023 kind of spooked some folks. They're like, if we go into a real recession, I'm going to have to hang on to this asset for a long time for it. And so we saw, we saw some folks exiting for those reasons. Yeah. I went and worked for uh, my father-in-law and uh, it was a good, uh, a good time. I learned an awful lot and what I thought would take six years to get it sold. Um, I mean, what I thought would take a year took six years yeah. and it was worth everything that I went through there because at the end of the time when we got it sold, uh, Floyd said, thank you. I would not have got it sold without you. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. That means, you know, as a son-in-law, you're like, yeah, we, yeah. it was a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, I mean, the, selling your business is one of the biggest life events you're going to go through. And especially for folks that have been, um, starting and growing their business for 30 years, they're working weekends, you know, 80 right. hour weeks. So it's, it's a major transition and, and we like to develop relationships to help them through that transition. You know, relationships in this business are great. There's some great folks in this business, especially in midstream and natural gas, like Steve Reese and a few that's of right. the other, isn't he cool? Yeah. So, yeah. Steve is great. Yeah. Um, yeah that's how I got connected to you. Um, and, uh, I just got to do a live interview with, uh, Steve at, uh, NAPE and, uh, next time we need to get you at NAPE cause that, be you there. know, uh, that is a lot of fun there and, uh, it'd be fun to have the three of us on a podcast. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and like, um, some of the ways that we work with, uh, folks like Steve, I mean, he's helping, uh, natural gas midstream operators grow their business, but yep. inevitably, um, owners are going to consider their exit strategy and you'd be surprised how many folks just don't think about it. Right. You're, you're yep. trying to grow your business. You're trying to get market share, but um, that exit sometimes can take five to 10 years. And so it's never too early to just consider it and right. check in, see what your business is worth, do evaluation, see if it's enough to retire on. Right. And then you can make plans accordingly. You know, when I, for my real day job, besides being CEO, is we take a look at oil and gas deals and then evaluate those because yeah. looking at the offsetting wells, not all deals are uh, created equal. Yeah. And so we, uh, my partner, uh, Michael Tanner, and I have had so much fun working with great uh, software and being able to analyze like some of the big boy things like Occidental and their uh, recent acquisition. You take a look at what they've got buried over here in their uh, carbon capture and how that may play in. Somebody may say it's not a good evaluation, but how do you figure out JT uh, other things that may make sense because yeah. you've got to know a lot about the industry in order to say wait a minute here's this price what are some of those kind of things does yeah. that make sense no it does absolutely kind of evaluation the industry yeah it's part art and part science right that's that's what uh, my dad always says and so we use you know very common cash flow models to do evaluation um you know looking at the balance sheet and in various cash flow models so that can kind of give you a multiple of ebitda and that's like your starting point. And then from there, you kind of add and subtract based on the art form of, you know, how well does this fit into the consolidation that's going on in the industry? What are the other, uh, you know, non-tangible assets um, that you might have that don't show up on your balance sheet? So, yep. you know, we like to do, you know, a typical cash flow evaluation to start. And then we decide, you know, is your company worth more than that for various reasons or less than that? Um, right. And and again, we're, we are lower middle market. So, a lot of the times um, just having like really well run uh, business with solid income statements, you're tracking your gross margin, you're paying attention to your expenses, just having a, a, a tidy house sometimes right. can make you more valuable to an acquirer because they, they, they trust your numbers. They know what they're buying.
You know, I've always seen um, uh, good Michael and I on our podcast always have good management, good numbers. That makes an evaluation a lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you take uh, CEOs like uh, Chris Wright over at Liberty uh, Energy. Love him. Love Toby. Love all the guys that are out there really running it from a entrepreneurial, even though they're publicly traded companies, they're family businesses. I mean, yeah. that's the way they treat them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and the valuations, I mean, they do kind of start to zero in across different industries and verticals, but we just saw um, uh, Trans Canada just sold the Portland natural gas transmission system up here in New England uh, to BlackRock or announced it. That was a 10x EBITDA valuation. And then if you look at the EQT, Equitran um, uh, announcement in, in Pennsylvania, Marcellus area, that's coming out at about a 5x. And they're both midstream assets, right? And right. within a couple months of each other. So uh, it can be pretty broad depending on what industry and vertical it, you're in. It'd be fun to sit back and have you and Michael uh, talk about EQT in a little bit more detail from that aspect. Because, yeah. uh, you know, some of the folks and the feedback we were getting is that they were kind of grumpy since that wasn't that an original split out. It was, right. And, yeah. and then he brings it back in. You're coming back in the fold. And then were the investors actually the only ones that got money it looked like from a surface? Again, I haven't stripped through it. Right. But, you know, were the bankers and then the management. And then you kind of figure out. <laughs> yeah. So and everybody looks at the value other, differently. Yeah, there were other things in there. And it'd be fun to strip that apart yeah. and take a look at that because I I absolutely respect Toby. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, if you sit back and kind of go, was it borderline for the investors? I highly doubt that he would do anything not good for his investors. I mean, yeah. if that makes sense. I, I agree. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with your corporate outlook on fossil fuels. I mean, you know, there are there are right. large companies that are continuing to acquire and consolidate, you know, standard infrastructure. And then those there are those that are divesting. I mean, Enbridge just bought up Dominion's gas distribution systems in the U.S., because Dominion wow. was kind of like, we're, we're moving away from that. We're getting more into electrification. So depending on what your corporate outlook is on the energy transition, you're going to value an asset very differently. Um, and Midstream is a great example. I mean, Midstream is a annuity, in my opinion, right? Pipeline oh, gets yeah. built, they get fully subscribed, their 20-year contracts, and that thing's going to throw off cash for the next 20 years. So long as you believe that we're going to continue to need that quantity of natural gas for the next 20 years, which I happen to believe, so... I believe, uh, in fact, I'm on the energy realities with David Blackman, Irina Slav, and Tammy Nemeth every Monday yeah. morning, and um, we are talking next week, I'm just now teeing this up, and that is for uh, the resurgence around the world for natural gas power plants. Yeah. Not, not only are they one of the only reasons that we've uh, really changed how much CO2 we've reduced in the U S by 20, I believe 22% in the last uh, few years, according to the EIA, which hates natural gas, I think <laughs> <laughs> um, is because of natural gas and the yeah. world is going back to natural gas. I, yeah. I, I think it's fabulous. Yeah. I, I, I think my experience of the last 15 years is that there was a, a big departure into the energy transition. Everybody wanted renewables and, uh, green assets. And then I believe they realized that they weren't scalable, they weren't profitable. And so a lot of the large invest investors oh, are going back to the oh, bread and butter. JD, I'm going to disagree with you on profit. Oh, really? Yeah. And here's where I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, they are, <laughs> they are not sustainable, uh, right. fiscally responsible from day one. Yeah. Uh, and Warren Buffett, you know, you and I both know Warren Buffett said, you can't invest in these silly things unless there's tax subsidies. That's right. Well, and, and do you see this out there where everybody says, oh, it's a 30 year wind farm? No, it's less than an eight year. And I have not found anybody that says the maintenance comes where it's horribly unprofitable at eight years and where they're double dipping. Now I'm now interviewing, uh, let's see, Paul T Tice today um on the esg uh, how esg investing will 
uh, yeah. this just totally wipe out the global crater, the global financial system. Yeah. And they're double dipping into the money and guess who's getting it, Paul JT. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the consumers, they get yes, to sir. pay for it in taxes and future value. I mean, this is yeah. and increased utility bills. Yeah. I mean, the, the consumer, the rate payer always pays, right? No matter who's butting the CapEx, it's the rate payer that's going to, you know, have the utility bill jacked up over time. And we're starting oh, to yeah. see that. So, yeah, I think, I think, and that's consistent with M&A. I mean, I think we're seeing people go back to investing in things that have standard rates of return that, you know, are profitable at today's interest rates. Right. And, um, you know, so just, you know, fuel distribution, like oil, propane, home heat, HVAC, um, those, those markets aren't going away. Right. Um, because we don't have a viable alternative, uh, no. to heat our homes, um, to, to, for transportation. So. A, a, a couple of things. Uh, let's go to midstream. I, I, I jump around a lot because I'm yeah, hyperactive I'm and you. I've had about six pots of coffee. Uh, you have a split T for our podcast listeners at home. Uh, besides having great looking hair, JT, <laughs> uh, I've got a flesh color and he's got the old mane there. I mean, yeah. you could be a lion if you were in the lion thing. <laughs> Uh, but you've got a split T over your shoulder, if I'm not mistaken, which is a half, uh, it's a heat pump. Uh, yep. if I'm, I'm taking a look at it that's right and i'm i'm okay with heat pumps but i they're being oversold and overplayed by the folks that think that they're actually a good thing i mean yeah. as your so main source i'm in maine uh maine is actually leading the nation in heat pump adoption um it's partly because of the subsidies that have been put out by the state um I personally believe because Mainers are frugal and prudent and they like to have multiple heat sources in their home. So I heat with propane and then I shave, you know, on the shoulder months with this nice little electric efficient heat pump. But really the reason I like it is because it gives me air conditioning in the summer, right? Which is what most Mainers don't have, right? So if you're a consumer, you're like, look, I'm going to be able to install this with a major tax rebate. I get air conditioning, which I never have. And I can turn it on on the shoulder months in October and not use my propane. That's a good deal. That's a good use. But to run your entire house on this heat pump when it's zero degrees in Maine, which it will be, and the electric grid behind that heat pump is insufficient to keep up with demand, we're going to be running straight into a big problem, right? So in New England, over 50% of our electricity comes from natural gas, right. which is a good thing. Yeah, um, it's great. But in New England, natural gas prices in the winter are through the roof because we've not been able to build adequate pipeline infrastructure. So like you said, we're getting hit on both sides. So we've got these new new technology innovation. But if the if the molecule feeding this is not reliable, affordable and sustainable, the consumer is going to pay for it in the end. Right. Oh, yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't the pipelines coming up? uh from boston area and those that is supplied by the lng and even we've had some uh, foreign countries uh deliver this past year that were sanctioned against <laughs> yes yeah every once in a while a, a russian flagship will show up in boston to uh to bail us out of a cold winter but um you know kudos to the midstream operators that are keeping the gas flowing but the reality is is that we're you know, 600 miles from the biggest gas reserves in the country, in the world, sorry. And we're paying I'm sorry, four, I get just four all times worked the price up. of the rest of the country. Yeah, it's bad. And we've got uh, Nick Delulius De De out of CNX, who is there yeah. in the Marcellus, a yeah. great deliverable, great CEO, yeah. great numbers, great deliverable for investors. I don't give investment advice, but um, it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. So from an from an M&A perspective, like policy and, and the regulatory environment are, are driving a lot of this M&A consolidation because wow. the small operators, again, they're they're getting regulated to death. Right. So, um, you know, whether it's EPA or state regulations uh, where we, we, we feel energy choice is is, you know, being attacked. Right. They want to get rid of natural gas. They want to get rid of natural gas furnaces. Um, so anybody that's providing a service into that space is also dealing with an enormous amount of regulations that really only the big companies can survive. So, wow. um, yeah. you know, it, it's it's driving uh, a lot of these folks saying, you know what, I, it's just not worth me running my business anymore. I, I think I should exit and, and sell to a bigger operator. You know, I'm I'm enjoying this conversation. Uh, I'll pay you later. But, um, <laughs> you know, when you sit back and take a look, 
regulatory uh, action will impact consumers yes. and legislation through regulatory action, legislation through regulations is pathetic. So when we sit back and see the war, I have to admit that the Biden administration is not racist when it comes to energy. They are equally stupid on all energy, wind, solar, nuclear. Uh, I'm I'm seeing that it is pathetic. So I'm I'm sorry for voicing my opinion. No, I, I mean, I share the same opinion, but it, <laughs> you can see it in the development cycle. I mean, it's just... We, we we can't build offshore uh, wind, right? So we we're we're blocking LNG exports through DOE permits, right? That's on hold. But at the same time, the alternative is: right, if we can't burn natural gas, we've got to use something. We can't even do offshore wind development because of all of the regulatory pressure. They don't financially work either, so that doesn't help. Um, but basically, there's just this kind of uncertainty that's left by all these policy measures, hoping and hope is not a strategy hoping that some energy innovation saves the day. And we just don't see that happening. Well, how is Tongue and Associates? Because, uh, you know, we, we talked about Steve Reese. Reese Consulting is so fantastic on mm -hmm. the uh, policies. And hey, Steve, if you ever listen to this, sorry for saying something nice to you, but uh, I'll <laughs> take you to dinner. Um, and, and, and so when you sit back and take a look, they know natural gas. I mean, they audit so much natural gas they know the regulatory how do you stay current at tongue and associates for the regulatory for m a does that make yes. sense yes it's, yeah, a, it's a nightmare it is yeah absolutely so i'll make one quick correction it's it's town associates just like lounge but with a t thank you we, we, i figured it would be helpful for the for the listeners but i get it all the time we respond to everything so uh, well um, uh let me let me just say i went to oklahoma state university and so, uh, you know, I have to go, I'm half Okie, half Texas. I'm a Texas resident right now. Yeah. So, you no, know, you got fair learn. enough. Um, and I, I got my MBA from the university of Oklahoma. So I actually, and I went to Fort Sill, uh, field artillery basic course there. So I, I have a fondness for Oklahoma. When did you get great. your MBA from Oklahoma city university? 2014, 2014 to 16. Okay. I got my MBA from the Oklahoma city university as well. Yeah. And I got a four point in it and it was brutal because at that time they were teaching uh, a bunch of the Juris doctorates were teaching the MBA program and they wanted to run everybody out. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah. I love your school. Uh, yeah. I, I got such a low grade at OSU that uh, I had to cover it up with an MBA from Oklahoma city. Yeah. I've never it's, been a good student. I, I, um, I, I, I consider myself a leader through my military experience, and that's what I bring to the table. But um, when it comes to pure academics, I'm, I'm not the guy to go to. So Neither but, am I. But I learned after I got out of my undergraduate. Yeah. Well, and uh, I mean, I've learned more about businesses by selling businesses than I did in my MBA. So, But to answer your question, um, Town Associates, we, we consider ourselves generalists. So really, we're the M&A expert. We can sell, nice. just, sell just about any company. But uh, it does help to be specialized in something. So right now, my dad, his background's in manufacturing, and he has nice. a specialty in commercial lighting. And uh, so folks that make LED lights for hospitals and hospital uh, hotels and things like that, he's been in that ecosystem for a long time through a partnership with some other experts. Um, my background's in oil and gas, more specifically natural gas. And so when it comes to M&A, if it's outside of my my area of expertise, I would reach out to a Steve Reese or to other experts that are in yep. that space. So like if there was a service provider in the Permian, right, uh, that I was doing a transaction for, I would bring in other colleagues that have operating experience in the Permian. They know what the takeaway capacities are. They know what the challenges are. So yep. we're a small group. We're a boutique M&A firm, but we we provide specialty practice and 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 consulting through a network of experts in the in the region um, and in the industry. You know what? I hope that this is a uh, uh, the first of a series because I'm enjoying our conversation, um, and I would like to do a regular series with you on M and A deals that you're doing. Yep. And we've got a series called the Deal Spotlight. 
And, and so we would like to uh, extend this out to other topics and have you come on and talk about yeah. appeal. And I'd like to have my uh, partner, Michael Tanner on these calls. Cause I think it would be absolutely way cool. Yeah. yeah the, the, the deal, the deal itself is always very fascinating because every deal is different. Um, yep. Deal points are, are, are critical when it comes to negotiation and making sure that it's a win, win, win solution. And, so at the end of the day, it's not always about the total transaction value. There's other deal points that are important to, to owners and to sellers. And so it's yep. fun to go back in hindsight and to dissect those and to figure out where the deal started and where right. it ended um, and, and, and for what reasons it went that direction. Uh, JT, how do people get a hold of you guys and uh, uh, your website and your yep. LinkedIn and go ahead and let everybody know on the podcast that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, townassociates.com is our website. Um, we list all of our uh, current transactions and uh, press releases. We do newsletters, so you can sign up for that. Um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, so Jeffrey yep. Towns at Town Associates on LinkedIn. I uh, like to stay uh, current on events. And I do a lot of public speaking or trying to do more public speaking at various conferences to talk about M&A, natural gas, and a lot of the energy transition challenges that we're faced with. So um yep. I'll uh, try and keep everybody current on what I'm doing out there. Hey, well, thank you so much. And, and I can't wait to visit with you again and we yeah, let's do it again, you and get all this all, all out there. Hey, and, uh, when you're in Oklahoma, let's go have dinner with Steve. Absolutely. We'll do.